My name is Jen Green. I'm a librarian, a digital scholarship librarian at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. And I work within the scholarly communication copyright and publishing program, which is housed within Dartmouth's library, but I serve the entire campus, including the hospital at um, Dartmouth Hitchcock. And this workshop is offered to everyone on the campus, um, students, faculty, and staff. Uh, but that's not exactly how the workshop got started. Uh, when I first offered it, I offered it as a two-day course um, called Managing Your Scholarly Identity Online, and that was for engineering um, PhD students and to talk with them about what they should be thinking about as new authors as they enter the pub publishing world, um, understanding their scholarly metrics, what their rights were when they signed publishing agreements, and then also a piece of um, what people were finding about them when they searched for them online. What, what did their online presence say about them? And the feedback from that class um, really led me to, the, to reformatting the workshop the way I do now. The students were really most interested in what are people finding out about me when they Google my name and how do I manage, take control of what that information and present it in a way that is advantageous to me as a scholar and a professional. So I thought, okay, let's offer the workshop for faculty and students. Um, and it just so happened that I, typically the way we offer workshops at Dartmouth is that we do workshops for faculty, we do workshops for students, and we do workshops for staff. Um, and I created this new two-day four-hour workshop and I accidentally sent the message out to the entire campus. <laughs> Um, and what happened was the workshop filled within five minutes, which, has, which was unprecedented. Um, and that told me that people were very interested in this topic of managing your professional identity. They did not care whether it was integrated with each other across ranks um, and disciplines. And so I went ahead and offered the workshop. And that, that one in October um, really led me to to um, format, reformat it a little bit more in that um, it was reaching such a broad range of people, people who typically didn't have the time to take two days um, out for a workshop. So now I do the workshop as a one hour session. Um, and I also tailor workshops for departments who have very specific needs that they want me to address in, in a scholarly um, or, or a professional identity workshop. So that's a little background information about what this workshop is. Um, rather than, I, I want to get you involved a little bit here, especially because it's just before lunch and maybe we're all a little hungry and tired, um, and to help you understand the way this works when I teach this session with these active learning techniques. So what I'm going to do is walk you through the first exercise that I um, take people through, um, which is I ask participants in the workshop to turn to the person next to them introduce themselves, and Google each other's names on their own <laughs> devices. So I'm going to give you two minutes to do that, and then we'll talk. OK, let's, I know that you're all engaged in probably some very interesting findings, um, but let's gather back together and talk a little bit about uh, what you might find. So typically, when I do this workshop, it's, there are about 15 to 20 people in the session, and so I'll have each of them go around and introduce each other. Um, and this is a great icebreaker. It gets people, um, they know each other's names, they get a sense of, okay, we're all here with the same kinds of questions, and we're all discovering some similar things that may be positive or negative, alarming or um, <laughs> otherwise <laughs> online about ourselves. So rather than do that, we're a large group, I'll, I'll either pick on somebody or I'll ask for a volunteer to introduce their partner and talk a little bit about what they found. Do I have any volunteers? I feel like I'm at the state fair right now. <laughs> <laughs> no volunteers. All right. I'm going to, oh, we've got one in the back. Thank you. Um, uh, so I guess am I supposed to introduce him? Then? Yeah, that would be great. I think each 
about it yesterday that we do a similar but different workshop at our institution. And uh, faculty often mention that things like grade my professor come up, and then some uh -huh. part of the uh, brief discussion is that people didn't know they can actually have, um, they can request that their rate my professor profiles are taken down. And so one person did that and was so relieved and thankful after the workshop. So just a little, a little yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that because that often happens to me. Um, and there are things that will, people will ask me. I really, one question was, um, how do I get Google to stop publishing my birth date? And this question came to me in the middle of a workshop and I had to say, you know, I don't really know exactly how you do that, but let me get back to you and we can figure this out together. Um, so this often, ha this is the kind of workshop where you have to be willing to explore questions that you know you're not going to have an answer to right away. Um, which is often why I end up um, scheduling one-on-one -on -one consultations with people afterwards to help them develop their presence in whatever way is meaningful to them. Um, so the next part we talk about with each other, what does professional identity mean to you? And so this exercise helps them kind of wrap their minds around that a little bit more. We won't dig into that question right now. If we have time at the end, we can, if you, if you feel like we, we can talk about that. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about why I asked you to Google your partner's name on your device as opposed to your own name? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, like your device knows you, so it will present what you typically look for or want to see. And you know, this is probably a standard concept to those of us in this room, but in leading this workshop, I've discovered there are a lot of people that really don't understand how online works. And having a space to talk about that together is, has been helpful and informative. Uh, so after we do this icebreaker session, um, this is typically a good time for me to lay out the context of what we, we should be learning today. And there are three main points that I, I like to emphasize in this particular workshop. One is that we all have an online identity, whether we are managing it or not, uh, whether we know it or not, it exists. And it's useful to go there and find it and see what's happening with it and to take care of it. And so we, d we go through, um, so in understanding that, they, they learn that we are going to discover some steps that they can take to help them easily do that. Um, one thing that didn't come up when we did our sharing right now, but usually comes up in the workshop, is people discover that there are other people that have the same name as them, which they hadn't thought about previously. So that's, at that point of the workshop, we'll go through ORCID and, ways that you can disambiguate yourself from others. Um, and then the last piece, depending on the audience of the workshop, I typically check the registrations before people get there and see, do I have a lot of faculty or publishing, or is this mostly a workshop full of staff? We talk about copyright in whatever way um, applies to them, and that typically starts with a question about, do you know about copyright? Do you want to have some basic information? And then we talk about that. Um, what are your rights if, as an author, these sorts of things. So to the first point about everybody's got an online identity, sometimes people walk into the room and tell me, I don't do anything online, so I don't know why, I, I'm curious how this is going to be helpful to me. And then we take a look at this image, which kind of lays out the, the various places that one might find themselves online without really thinking about it. And it gives people a, a, some time to step back and say, oh, I do have a Netflix account. Um, I do th stream content. I do listen to music. I do purchase things online. And all of these are ways that you develop a certain type of identity for yourself. And you may have created accounts over the years that you want to revisit or things that you created and don't use any longer and, and think about that. Um, the other part of this that I, I go through with them is um, to, I've, I try to emphasize the point that it's a good idea to establish an online home for yourself and to take care of that home. And this is like um, when we find a physical home, it's a place that we're comfortable. We, it's easy for us to get to. We go there frequently, and we take care of it, and we keep it 
presentable in the way that's, that represents us. And so your online home should be something similar. It doesn't have to be difficult, but it should be a place that, that you establish as yours and you go back to and you take care of. And so for me, it's a WordPress site. I have a, a page that's dedicated to my professional self. And at Dartmouth, we offer students, faculty, and staff the ability to create a WordPress site while they're at the institution. And so for us, um, if, if there's an interest in that, we'll stop at that point and I'll go to the place where they can actually request their site and walk them through the steps of getting started with that. And that often leads to an individual consultation later with me about what kinds of information would I want to present about myself. Um, with my online home, I tell people, you know, keep it simple. Um, but also recognize the other places where you might have presence online and link those places back to your online home. Because when people search for you in that Google search that we did initially, the more places that link back to your online home, uh, the, the more likely your, your home page is going to come up in a Google search result. So I just show them the example of, you know, I also have a LinkedIn page, I have a blog, and these are all places that I link back to the site, and I also show you where you can get to from my, my location. So the next part of the workshop is um, the name disambiguation. And for most of the people that register for this workshop, they either don't have an ORCID, don't know what ORCID is, or they have one and um, they've never done anything with it, they haven't populated it. So um, just as an example, how many of you in this room have heard of ORCID? Okay, almost everybody. How many of you have an ORCID ID? Okay, and how many of you have fully fleshed out your ORCID ID? Okay, so that's pretty much what I expected for this audience. When I run the workshop, there are probably half, half of the people who've heard of ORCID, another half of those have an ORCID ID, and then just a handful of them have actually um, populated their ORCID ID and made those um, connections with other trusted parties. So depending on what the response was in the room, we'll either go, um, I'll either, explain to them what ORCID is and why they should get one. Um, or we may go to the ORCID site and I'll give everybody time to create their ORCID ID right there so that I can be there and answer questions for them if they have them. Um, and if they already have an ORCID ID, they log in and they can ask me questions at that time. Okay, what's the most important information that I should be adding to my ORCID ID? So this part of the workshop looks like me running around the room um, answering a variety of questions. And so I found that if I can get somebody, um, one of my staff or students to help me with the workshop, this is a great um, opportunity for a student to step in and help answer those individual questions. So the last part of the workshop is about sharing your work and is about copyright. And like I said, this, the content of this really depends on who's at the workshop and how familiar they are with copyright. So um, the two questions that typically come up, I'll ask people, what do they know about copyright? What are their concerns about it? And often, um, if they're authors in the room, they want to know, what do they have the right to share of their published work? Um, and if there aren't authors in the room, the question typically revolves around what can I share of my content without losing credit for the work that I've done? So th this is typically pertaining to maybe images that they've shot that they want to share on a Flickr site, but they, they also want to receive credit for that work. So this, these are good doorway, doorway questions into um, providing some basic copyright information. And many of you are probably using this analogy, but this has been extremely helpful for me in working across a variety of disciplines and areas of expertise and um, levels of experience with copyright. A lot of people, even if they understand copyright, think of it as a box that they have or they don't have. Um, they understand that if they create something, they own the copyright. But the nuance of the of uh, the fact that copyright is more like a bundle of sticks, and that you can decide which sticks you're going to keep and which sticks you're going to give away. 
And so this is um, where I introduce Creative Commons. And this is an ability for them to tell people, especially if they're sharing content that they haven't already licensed to a publisher, um, these are the sticks that I want to keep. These are the sticks that I want to give away. That's what a license agreement is. So they can post their image and say, I want to keep the stick that says you, can, you can't profit from this work, but you can use it and you can um, give me credit for it and you can use it in the same way that I've shared it with you. Um, I'm often surprised by how, at this point, I've, I've I've assumed that people have heard of Creative Commons and understand it and know how to use it and what it is, but that's not true. Um, this has been a really, um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from my participants about how helpful they found to learn a little bit more about Creative Commons. And if there's time in the workshop, we'll go, go to the Creative Commons site. Um, I'll ask somebody to pull up a PowerPoint presentation that they recently did for work and we'll walk through the process of creating a license so that they can see how easy it is. I think Creative Commons can feel like a very mysterious place, um, but it's, it's the message that's important here um, is that if you want to share things and you just post it online without a license, you've created a barrier to the access because people who find it online don't know exactly what they're allowed to do with it. Just like when you're looking online for images and you want to know, can I use this in a certain way? Um, if there's no license, you're likely to go look somewhere to use that um, resource. So I try to make the point that licensing is a way of um, sharing freely and openly and fairly with others. And that is... Um, kind of in a nutshell what happens in this workshop. I wanted to leave you some time for questions. Yeah. Please use the microphone. Do participants end up having a lot of questions about managing their personal online identity? And do you ever kind of want to draw a box around just talking about scholarly identity? I do, yeah, I do get a lot of questions about personal identity. And when people ask those questions, it's really coming from a place as all of a sudden they realize what, what, they're, what people are finding out about them online in a personal way has an impact on how they're perceived professionally. And so I kind of navigate that question from that perspective. Um, and then what often comes next is, um, well, if I create an ORCID, why, why should I have a LinkedIn? Or if I have a LinkedIn, why should I create an ORCID? And so we talk about those things. And, and in the end, what happens is people will say, I created a LinkedIn account, and I haven't been back to that site for a couple of years. Um, what do you think I should do with that? And I encourage people to consider closing accounts that they don't um, use actively because of the dangers of just having something out there. So it, it does, it, all of it meshes together. I don't draw this line between um, this is professional identity, we're only talking about this because we all develop this understanding that it all kind of merges together in the end. My question is quite similar. Do you, do you ever get questions about how to keep um, separate, different professional identities? So if someone is researching in different fields but wants to try and keep those slightly separate, and do you have any tips for that? Yeah, so uh, this question often comes up with the um, PhD students that um, take the, the workshop. And so it often is, relates to Facebook, for example. They want to have a professional Facebook presence and then a personal Facebook presence. And we do dig into um, privacy or the privacy settings in Facebook. And I don't discourage people when I talk about developing your online home. I don't encourage one platform over the other. I, I, I say, you know, you should understand the platform that you choose and understand what its uh, risks and limitations and advantages are. And so I do um, dig in with, with them about that piece of it. For faculty, um, they have such little time that I often hear from faculty 
just tell me one place that I should go. Um, and I, I, don't, um, I don't step into that arena of advising people on the place that they should go. I t try to listen to them about where, are you, uh, where do you already exist and what are the most important things that you need to say. But it's really, it's really difficult to, I mean, there, there are platforms like Google Profiles and ResearchGate and, that are more of that scholarly professional world and then people also have their social platforms and I think just the thing to emphasize is understand what each of those tools are doing when what each of them are saying about you. Um, you just mentioned the Google profiles and it's sort of an interesting thing is going on with Google right now with this thing called Google Plus. <clears throat> so it's sort of becoming Google minus, I think, uh, or, or it's ceasing to exist. So do, do, do you ever talk about transitioning from one, one platform to another? So, or things like ResearchGate, you know, these things have the, they, they come and they grow and they go, maybe. So do people ever talk to you about that? Yeah, element? they do. Yeah, they ask about that. They ask about that when I present the idea of um, creating a WordPress site. If they do that and they leave the institution, how do they move? that content and these are all things that you can do and but they're not always easy to do and you might need help doing that and I do offer that specific help. Um, what really comes up is okay I want to I don't want to use ResearchGate anymore but I want to put all of my publications in ORCID and then I have to explain well that's not a, that's not a service that ORCID provides um, and also deeper questions about when I put what is ResearchGate actually allowing me to do and what is that do I have the right to do that there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about just because you can put a PDF on ResearchGate doesn't mean that you actually should or have the right to do that and so it it leads into all of these questions lead into like a series of smaller questions, which is why um, often what happens is I'll, I'll get a question like this and I'll say, you know, we, we really need to schedule time and I need to hear more about what it is exactly that you're trying to do. What system are you trying to move from one? To, and at first I thought I'm going to be overwhelmed by work, but in the end, um, it's, it's really been not so terrible and really helpful to, to the individual who asks. We have time for one yeah, other. Just a, a, this is great, and a couple comments, or uh, one comment, one question. Uh, for whether you have multiple com multiple situations and for multiple streams, I have often suggested that they put a note in whatever, like ResearchGate, that says, "I maintain my profile on X." I think that's so, a great. Yeah. So you're pointing yep. them to the authority, yeah. and that means that they have the point of presence, but not. Yes. How are you helping them with some of the microformat publishing, like Twitter and that kind of milieu? <laughs> so Twitter. Uh, it really depends. So if I do a workshop that is tailored for a department, like the, the Cancer Center contacted me and said, somebody in our department attended your workshop and we want you to talk more about X. Um, that would be a place where I would dig into something deeply like Twitter if that's what they wanted to hear. Um, when I offer a general workshop, I mention Twitter um, and we talk a lot about how you are sharing, what you're using Twitter for. So one of the questions, one of a specific question was, I just published a book. I want to start a Twitter account and start promoting my book on Twitter. And I, in that particular situation, I said, you know, it's not the probably the best practice to just start using something to promote yourself. Twitter is a place where you um, develop a presence and become a part of a community and you share ideas and information professionally and then you also have the ability to, when you do work, to share that work. Um, you lose some credibility if you just create an account and start promoting something and then become silent on Twitter. So, And then that leads into, 
you know, I have a Twitter presence and I try, but I've also thought, am I using Twitter enough? I use Twitter when, mainly when I come to conferences like this and then I go back to my work life and I become less active on Twitter. And so I have to step back myself and say, is that a tool that's working for me? Is that a tool that's, um, that's representing me in a positive way when I become a voice in a certain time and space, but an absence in another time and space. Um, I, you know, I didn't prepare any official clothing remarks, but. Oh. Go for lunch, maybe. But oh, yeah, 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 lunch. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm fine. Any other questions? Okay. Sorry. So, how often do you give these workshops? Because it seems like there'd be a lot of demand in, in different frameworks. There, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, most of the workshops I do, I feel like I run them once or twice a year. Um, this particular workshop I now do at least on a monthly basis because, and that started this past spring uh, because I offered it, it filled, five people emailed me and said I couldn't get into the workshop when you're offering it next so I just go to my calendar and put it on the next time. I'm offering it again during open access week and um, again the workshop is full and so I have to think about um, and so I, my plan is to just keep offering it like that until people stop coming, um, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. And that's the only hour, the one hour. That's the one hour format. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Is it only at Dartmouth? It, yeah, right now it's only at Dartmouth. Yeah. Um, I guess in between the one hour workshops, I schedule about a handful of individual consultations every month. That result from that workshop. So, and that can range from sitting down with somebody and helping them get a WordPress site started to um, figuring out their ORCID connections to any other question they might have. Yeah. Um, I have a question. And let's make this the last question because we don't want to miss My question is about, I'm doing similar workshops, but usually the spike right before Tiena and Promotion Committee. Oh, uh, yeah. So right now I uh, ask everybody, can you do it ahead of time? Because you have to collect statistics. The main mm -hmm. idea behind all of that, actually, collect statistics, your impact factor. Mm -hmm. Alternative, obviously, impact factor. And also, we have a system, digital measures. Okay. And now we can input this out metrics and metrics into digital measures. So I have to do it systematically. I have to contact every team, uh, promotion tenure committee chair and discuss all this. With them. Uh, that, that's so it's, it became yeah. more systematic and not sporadic, like. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple ways that this workshop gets scheduled. One is I just post it to the entire campus. I, people register. I see who registers. I prepare as quickly as I can for what I think that audience might be interested in, or a department will contact me and say, you know, we we'd like you to come and talk about this particular thing. Or we want workshop for us and then I will schedule time with them to get a better understanding of what exactly they thought of it. Um, so it, I've had to really think of my feet and be flexible and willing to uh, adjust and prepare quickly. I'm not sure what's happening with this microphone. But <laughs> it's, a sign. it's a sign that it's time. This microphone needs lunch. 